Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 53, Medieval Stage Effects. Last time, we got into some detail about how the Corpus Christi cycle plays were organised and rehearsed, and some idea of how the playing areas were organised, with three different types of presentation, the wagon, the round and the marketplace. Despite these different locations, the plays developed with very similar stage conventions. I also included a word on the Saints play, another type of medieval drama closely related to the cycle plays that told the life of a particular saint and often focused on the privations and torture that the saint was subjected to. In both the cycle play and the saint's play there was considerable use of special effects and I thought it would be interesting and fun to devote an episode to that subject. We have some details about such things from a diverse number of sources but again it's a rather fragmented picture where we can only build up a partial picture of the types of the effects used. But I do think it's worth lingering here as it's a continuation of a fine tradition of the idea of the stage being a place of illusion, where fantastical things can appear to happen. This goes back to the ancient Greeks and was fully endorsed by the Romans, so theatrical traditions don't get much longer than that. I think it's also an element where we can really see that medieval man enjoyed this aspect of the plays, and it's a timely reminder that they were enjoyed for their spectacle as much as for their storytelling and their religious message. As a species, we enjoy being amazed at seeing the unexpected or the apparently inexplicable, so I don't think this is a surprising reaction. But it speaks to our natural curiosity, intelligence and inventiveness that is one of the things that marks us out from other animals. But before we get to that, I wanted to cover off another point. I've been asked why I'm not using the term mystery plays when discussing the Corpus Christi plays. That is the term that's most commonly used and there isn't anything wrong with it. My preference is to use cycle plays or Corpus Christi plays because I think this describes them better in terms of their style, intent and origin. The term mystery play can, I think, be a little confusing. Its origin is uncertain. It may refer to the mystery inherent in Christ's ministry and God's plan for mankind, which the plays attempt to give an explanation for. Alternatively, it's been suggested that it is being used in the same way that the Greek plays were referred to as mysteries, where the rites and origins of the religious groups that organised the plays were held in secret. You may remember that Aeschylus and Sophocles were both said to have had links to the families that held religious rites in secret. Another idea is that the term may be a poor use of the term ministerium, meaning a religious service or office. Now that seems very plausible, given the growth of the plays out of the church service. And one final suggestion is that mystery refers to the effects I'm about to discuss, which were magical and mysterious to the audience. All these are good possibilities, and without a single compelling explanation, the choice is down to personal preference. So what do we know about medieval stage machinery and special effects? Well, most examples we have come from the late medieval period, more or less all in the late 15th and 16th centuries. So we assume that the earlier plays had more rudimentary effects. What is left to us is the apogee of the art. And as we discuss effects, I'm going to mention the use of scenery quite a lot. The two were often intrinsic and the use of scenery became an extensive and significant part of the stage effect in itself. Just to give you an idea of the scope and scale that was achieved, here is an account of a performance at Valenciennes in France in 1547 by Henri Dutermann, a local historian and artist. Where he refers to truth here in this quotation, it is as a character in the play. The machines of paradise and of hell were absolutely prodigious and capable of being taken by the populace for magic. For there one saw truth, the angels, the other characters, descend from on high, sometimes visibly and sometimes invisibly, and then without warning. Lucifer arose out of hell, riding on his dragon, without anyone being able to see how it was achieved. Moses' dry and sterile rod suddenly sprouted flowers and fruit. The souls of Herod and Judas were carried up into the air by the devils. The productions at Valenciennes were some of the most spectacular and well-funded ever produced, and clearly not every location would have been able to afford or engineer such spectacle. 
but the use of lavish additions to the plays was nevertheless common enough. The use of scenery and special effects was not so very far removed in spirit from those which still attract and delight audiences in the theatre and at a magic show or stadium concert today. So I think we should accord a good deal of respect to the technical sophistication of theatrical presentations in the late Middle Ages, even if there is a big difference in intent between what they did and what we appreciate now. We enjoy such things for the spectacle and, yes, the intrigue of how they're being achieved. This was probably also true of medieval man, but he was also seeing a miracle repeated, a saint martyred. I don't mean to say that they actually believed these things were happening, although doubtless some of the audience did, but it affirmed their belief in something they already believed was true. Nor should we ignore the spectacular quality of the costumes and the stage properties, which also added to the overall effect. Quality and quantity inevitably varied, but they were as sumptuous as costs of available fabrics and other materials would allow. There was an element of competition and showing off between the guilds, so expensive and ostentatious design and construction was the order of the day wherever possible. And the care lavished upon the design and construction could be as if the commission had come from princes of the state or the church. Account books from across Europe confirm that largesse was common. The Smiths Guild at Coventry between 1450 and 1550 recorded the purchase of white leather for God, I think meaning a white leather cloak or tunic, gold and silver foil for mitres, and scarlet cloth for a bishop's tabard. In 1576, Worcester Cathedral sold its players' costumes, and the bill of sale survives in the records. The stored costumes included a king's cloak, a jerkin and a pair of breeches, a little cloak of tissue, a gown of silk, a jerkin of green, two caps and the devil's apparel, wicks, furs, armour, the wings of angels. Items such as gloves, copes and jewellery feature regularly in lists of expenditure from several locations, and those from Italy are of particularly high expense and grandeur. Costumes always remain true to the principle of dressing in modern style in an equivalent mode to the character in question, but clearly the designers still wanted to make their actors look very special. Scenery was also something that grew in complexity with the plays over time. Initially, it was sparse and symbolic to loosely define the place of the action. But by the later period, it was a significant feature of the stage area. Again, we have some evidence from Valenciennes, from their passion play of 1547. Hubert Callieu was a stage designer and miniaturist working in the town at the time, and he made sketches of the stage designs, and they remain some of our best evidence for set design from the period. They show the different scenic three-dimensional backdrops that were used for the different location in the play. These locations stretched across the stage, from stage right to stage left. Starting from stage right, we have Paradise. This is a pillared portico-type room, topped with a large disc covered with an image of God on his throne, surrounded by angels. Nazareth comes next, represented by a gateway in the city walls, and with a low gate and fence in front, which creates an acting space in front of the walls of the city. The temple is another portico room, but this one is topped with an ornate roof, covered blue in the illustration. Inside, there's an altar supporting the Ark of the Covenant, all of which is visible to the audience. Jerusalem is next, represented with a city wall and gate, but much grander than Nazareth. Next is the palace which is perhaps the grandest building set as it is on a high plinth with pillars with a suggestion of gold trimmings and a throne fit for a king. The House of the Bishops is another gate in the wall, but this also shows a representation of the top of the palace behind the wall, giving a real feeling of depth and a hinterland to the scenery. The same city wall continues to the Golden Gate, an imposing gateway with tall, sturdy-looking doors. In front of this is a square patch of blue with a fishing boat sitting in it representing the sea. Clearly, it's showing a functional pool of water. Limbo is represented by a prison building housing several souls awaiting judgment. And finally, on the far stage left, we get to the gates of hell, represented by a dragon's mouth from which devils are exiting. Inside the dragon's mouth, people struggle to get out of a boiling cauldron and in the level of the tower immediately above this, two unfortunates have been strapped to a wheel. On the roof above them, three dragons breathe fire, and all of this is orchestrated by Lucifer, who sits on another dragon above the whole scene. 
It's an incredible illustration and I've posted a link to the picture in the show notes so you can take a look for yourself. Perhaps the most striking thing about the set, apart from the amount of cost and effort creating it must have taken, is that Limbo and Hell appear to get the most attention. Paradise looks rather boring compared to the drama at the other end of the stage. There's another surviving illustration of a stage set from the play of St Lawrence, which was produced in Cologne, Germany in 1581. The locations are different, of course, to suit the story of the saint's life, but the overall design, moving from heaven or paradise through various locations to the gate of hell, is similar in concept. In this case, the set includes a pagan altar, a living tree and 12 different locations. These two illustrations seem to prove that the concept of the world as a stage was explicitly carried through the medieval period from antiquity, until it found renewed voice in Shakespeare, who summed it up in his famous lines from As You Like It. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women are merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. This idea of Theatrum Mundi, the world as the stage, or the stage as the world, meant the stage could represent the real world and the invisible world. Since Plato and his theory of the cave, and then the Neoplatonists that influenced early Christian philosophy, God's creation was seen as having a dual embodiment. There was the real world that mortals inhabited, and the invisible but no less real world of heaven and hell and limbo, also known as purgatory. Part of the nature of the stage presentation as it developed was that it could show the invisible worlds, positioned as they were on opposing edges of the stage, and palaces and thrones, places of mortal and real-world judgments, were in between them in central positions. This was an extension of long-held ideas that stretched back to Plato and were often repeated in the church service, so the symbolism for the plays would not be missed. Where the building of set and scenery became elaborate, those organising the plays sometimes commissioned special pieces to be built. There are records of expenses that give us some idea of some of the special items that were prepared. From one account it says, To Geoffrey Dupont, for five and a half days of his time employed by him for the fitting of the serpent with pipes for throwing flames. And in another case, To Master Yehan Dufet and his assistants numbering seventeen persons, for having helped in hell for nine days during said mystery. And again, a pair of gloves for God, four pairs of angels' wings, and a link for setting the world on fire. And from Mons in France, eight working loads of grass, birds, rabbits, lambs, fish and other animals all alive, various trees, apples, cherries, fig leaves and various real fruits and imitation. In this last example it's thought that the animals were for the play of Noah and the flood, and the fruits of the tree to represent the Garden of Eden. Other props mentioned in similar records are a false body of St John, a rib for the creation of Eve, pulleys to be used in the hanging of Judas, and soft batons for the beating of Jesus. Some of these roles were clearly not without risk. One wonders with what trepidation the actor playing Judas put his head in the noose, hoping that whatever safety measures existed would kick in at the right moment. The actor playing Jesus no doubt did it with passion and commitment. I'm reminded of religiously extreme Filipinos who to this day allow themselves to be nailed to a crucifix as part of the Easter celebrations. But our medieval actor must have been grateful for those soft batons. Let's hope they didn't look too soft. And not all the effects are difficult to achieve. I remember a production of Jesus Christ Superstar in London where the whipping of Christ was very effectively achieved by trails of blood being thrown and landing on Jesus as he was moved around the stage by the chains he was bound with. It really did look like he was being whipped. The same effect could have been easily made in medieval times where animal blood was freely available to the medieval producers as animals for food were killed in almost every home. For the beheading of a saint, a false head could be filled with the same material and provided a suitably gory spectacle, although sadly the sleight of hand used to achieve the beheading effect isn't recorded. All sorts of magical effects were attempted and achieved to one degree or another. Water was changed into wine before the wedding guests. Rocks were terrifyingly split in two with devils leaping out from inside them. Thunder was created and shook the air with the use of sheets of copper, expensive objects in themselves, and rocks rolled in barrels. Water effects were particularly popular. Sets were constructed with hidden pipes or water tanks on the roof of the scenery. 
so that a rain effect could be achieved as Noah gathered animals into his ark. Records indicate that some of these piping systems must have been quite extensive, as the flooding of significant parts of the stage, or round, are mentioned. So the events like Jesus walking on the water could be acted out. Fountains gushed up from pipes that ran down from overhead. The dry staff of Moses burst into flower, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes was re-enacted, and the multitude fed. The best effects were left for hell and the devil. The gaping dragon's mouth at Valenciennes had a hinged jaw so that it could be opened and closed. In 16th century Coventry, two payments for individuals are noted, eight pence for keeping hell's mouth, and four pence for keeping the fire in hell's mouth. Again, this was a mobile mouth, but does not sound as impressive as the mouth of hell presented in Metz in 1437, which was also automated and swallowed and then vomited out victims, apparently of its own volition. And all this with eyes that glinted in a menacing fashion. The hell represented by Toledo in Spain in 1493 ejected fire by the use of rockets. And all of this with no health or safety or fire certificate required. The pyrotechnics and fires were a risk, and there are some reports of sets burning and villages being put in danger of the fires from the plays. For the pyrotechnics, gunpowder, tar, oil, bitumen and other flammable materials were used to replicate the horrors of the underworld. The impression is that there was an urge to push the boundaries of what it was possible to show to the very limits. I haven't found any record of fatalities or serious injury where the preparations of stage effects is concerned, but I think it's safe to assume that there must have been some. The stink of hell could be replicated by use of liquids taken from the local tannery, who made use of animal excrement and urine in large quantities to soften hides, or from the dyers too, who used the same materials. There's even mention of the rubbish from hospitals, including body parts, being used to add to the dreadful sights and smells of hell. The devil visibly metamorphosized into new shapes and rode a scaly dragon. Next to Lucifer, Herod and Judas were the most popular villains, and could be swept up into the air and borne off by demons. Occasionally, the fantastically attired actors descended to the streets, and the action took place in the very midst of the crowd. These images of hell were so vivid and popular that it's thought that it is the hell of the plays that influences artistic and literary descriptions of hell at the time, and not the other way around. As I've mentioned, heaven and hell were set at opposite ends of the set, so the enjoyment of the play could be greatly affected by your seating position. In some places, admission to a seat near heaven was more expensive than those near the hell end of the stage. That may have a dual reason. From a theological point of view, if you could afford the heavenly seats, that is probably where you wanted to be seen to be seated anyway, rather than slumming it near hell with the lowest of the low. And from a practical point of view, just imagine trying to watch the play with all the flames and stink of hell happening right near your ear and nose. That is not an easy ask. But hell didn't have a complete monopoly on special effects. Heaven required the elevation of actors playing Jesus, Mary and the saints. Initially, and for smaller presentations, there might literally be a stairway to heaven. But for the more sophisticated, pulleys and ropes could be used to transport the righteous aloft, and to suspend clouds, the sun and the moon, stars and the angels. For the crucifixion, some supportive arrangement must have been used to avoid the poor actor suffocating, and for the assumption into heaven, ropes, pulleys and harnesses were probably the order of the day. These techniques were similar to the ancient Greek deus ex machina, but probably invented independently of that ancient theatrical tool. Cranes were used in construction projects and as the machinery of warfare at the time, so it would not have been a big leap to see how they could be used for the cycle plays and theatrical purposes. A simple wooden crane could be installed behind part of the scenery or off stage, and the actor put in a harness. The use of pulleys to lift heavy weights and the need to counterbalance with heavy rocks or metal was already well understood, so the crane operator could lift and then move the actor as appropriate. Where the stage was raised, much could be made of trapdoors for the unexpected entrance or exit and for swarming devils to suddenly appear. A theatrical distraction, a bang, a puff of smoke, could be used to cover such an entrance or exit, just as they still are today. Perhaps for some of the most ambitious effects, trained acrobats were employed as stunt doubles for the actors. Or maybe the actors were brave enough and willing to put themselves at some risk of injury, believing that this was worship with the church's blessing, so God would not allow any serious mishap. 
So these were all rather literal interpretations, but spectacular for the audience. We have to remember that medieval man was a naturally suspicious person, who believed in God and the devil, in witches and warlocks, and the reality of the invisible world. And this was with good reason. Death was always close, particularly in the years when plague raged across Europe. In that context, a belief in an eternal paradise and a permanent state of bliss was an effective balance to the privations and reality of everyday life. People wanted to believe in the horrors of hell, because if hell existed, then heaven did too. But I feel I have to return to the question that I asked last time. Was the acting any good? Were the effects believable? As I pondered previously, perhaps that's not quite the point. Shakespeare set to the same question a century or so later in A Midsummer Night's Dream, where he painted an amusing picture of a rehearsal by a group of bumbling but eager rustic actors. These are caricatures, of course, but they probably refer back to this kind of amateur theatre. There were contemporary complaints about the incompetence of some players, particularly those who spoke badly, had poor voices, or who were clumsy or crude. That there were some performances that left something to be desired is not surprising. These were volunteer amateurs, and the casts were very large. The prompt book at Mons reveals that 317 actors participated in the pageant there, covering nearly a thousand roles. With those sorts of numbers, there had to be an element of scraping the barrel in the selection of willing actors. But rehearsals can train an actor in the use of voice and the prop and the special effect, so perhaps they did carry it off better than we might imagine. Playing a devil at hell's mouth where you just had to cavort about in a threatening manner was probably easier than being hoisted aloft and making it look unnaturally natural, unless, of course, you were one of the devils with gunpowder and wadding in your pitchfork or stuck around your body to be set off at the appropriate moment. That sounds quite risky by any standard. As much as a harness can be somewhat hidden under a costume, the effect of being lifted must have been quite uncomfortable at least and could end up with the actor flailing around in mid-air or impaled on the scenery or to come crashing down unceremoniously to the ground. Even when things went well, it's difficult to imagine that this was very effective. But, as much as we can talk about simpler people in simpler times enjoying simpler pleasures and being in awe of the inexplicable, I think this probably does them a disservice. Surely, they were just as capable as we are of enjoying the spectacle for the effect and for the cleverness of its execution, but also of laughing at the wobbly set or an actor caught in an awkward position. The costume malfunction, the scenic failure, probably still gave them a laugh, just as it does us today. Given the presence of animals, amateur actors and stage effects, there's a lot of jeopardy in the cycle plays, and perhaps the audience enjoyed that too. There seems little doubt that part of the attraction of the cycle plays was for the spectacle and the awe and the wonder that theatrical effects could create for the audience. We lack the details of exactly how these effects were achieved, no plans or technical drawings have survived, but clearly a lot of effort was put into the sets, the costumes and the special effects, and towards the end of the period it begins to feel like the sophistication of effects and scenery were becoming a real driving force in the presentation of the plays. We are left with the lingering impression that the mouth of hell was the most enjoyed effect and often had the most attention lavished on it. Human nature, it seems, has not changed so much. We all still like to be amazed, scared and shocked as part of our entertainments. And who doesn't like a good baddie, especially if we can boo and hiss them as they get carried off to eternal damnation? Or is that just me? Next time, I'm going to look at the detail of some of the English cycle plays and look at the language they use and the literary effect that they were going for. This isn't just an English bias on my part, although the English plays are the most accessible in print. Continental examples exist, but because the effect of the plague and wars were slightly less devastating in England than on the continent, the English plays have more opportunity to flourish and therefore develop, and are generally thought to be of better literary quality. So, among others, we will be in the company of the shepherds, Noah, and of course, the devil. In the meantime, please don't forget to take a look at the pictures on the website, that's www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com, relating to this and the previous episode. The link is again in the show notes. I've also again used the pictures mentioned in the Facebook and Twitter promotions, so while you're there, please give the podcast a follow or a join on the Facebook group. 
please go to the Patreon offering where you'll find episodes on Plato's life and a summary of his philosophy, and on the Neoplatonists, which provide some background for this episode, along with much else. These and all of the extra audios are there for a small monthly fee. Go to patreon.com slash thoetp to find out more. All contributions go towards offsetting the cost of hosting the podcast and are gratefully received. If you have any questions, comments or concerns, you can always contact me by email on thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Thank you.